On this lecture, uh, we're going to talk about electrical power and what it means. We're going to start by first of all telling you that it is the rate at which the energy is converted into another form. I'm going to give you a simpler definition than that. We can say quite simply that in a closed circuit or in a circuit that involves a toaster, involves a lamp in which, or which involves a hair dryer, for example, the electrical power is given as current times the volt. It's easy to see this if you expand out what each of these terms mean. The voltage is the energy gained of the electrons per unit charge, which for electron is 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And the current is equal to the number of charges per second. So if I multiply the number of charges per second by the energy gained per charge, I get the energy consumed or used per second. And energy consumption per second or joule per second is what we call the watt. And we talked about that in the mechanics section of the course as well. So power is, is in watts. What we end up paying for when we use electricity in the house or in the business is the, a, a quantity called the kilowatt hour. Kilowatt hour is basically, what a kilowatt hour is telling us at this rate or this, this cost amount says that if I am using 1000 watts continuously for one hour, the electricity company is going to charge me 20 cents for that. So every time I use, if I use a, a thousand watts for one hour, I am going to be using, getting a, a bill for 20 cents. Now, kilowatt hour can also be converted to joules. It's a thousand watts and an hour is 3,600 seconds. So that's 3.6 megajoules, 3.6 million joules is a, is a kilowatt hour. If you look at electricity bill and you find out that let's say you're paying $100 a month, then what this tells you is that I am using about 500 kilowatt hours every month in the home with electricity use. So if I'm using 500 kilowatt hours, which means I could be using, well, let's just leave it at that. That's the total number of kilowatt hours. If you were to look at the number of hours in a month, it would typically be about, about 7,000 hours. So if you were using, say, $500 was your average cost over 7,000 hours, then I would be using something like 100 watts effectively every second of every hour of every day. Anyway, it's a way of calculating cost. And this is what the electricity company charges you for. The battery lifetimes are given in terms of amps hours, which is total charge. So charge per second or current, or I should say coulombs per second, times the number of seconds, which is what an hour, an hour is 3,600 seconds, gives me the total charge that the battery is capable of before it dies and it will stop generating any more power. I can use that battery if it was 10 amp hours, for example, that means that I could use the battery for I, could, for, I could run it at 10 amps for one hour or at 100 amps for a tenth of an hour, which would be about six minutes. So the product tells me how long the battery will last. Car batteries are only 12 volts, but they deliver hundreds of amps, but only for a very short time, typically of the order of a couple seconds. And they're rechargeable. So a car battery, assuming the charging device of the battery, which is called the alternator, is working, will never run out of power and it is generating huge amounts of, of current. Typically, by the way, one way to compare this is that your the body uh, will instantly die from a current that exceeds even a fraction of an amp. So a fraction of an amp, which is a tenth or a hundredth of an amp, is enough to kill a human being. So putting your hands across the terminals of a car battery that can deliver um, hundreds of amps could be extremely, extremely dangerous. Compact fluorescent lamps called CFLs, these are incandescent lamps, dissipate most of their energy in the form of heat. And they have since been replaced by LED lights. So LED lights are a different type that has actually revolutionized the lighting industry and is making it far cheaper to run. The problem that when you use all this electricity to 
make the bulb hot enough to generate light, most of that energy goes into heat, which does not help you see in the dark. So that is not uh, very good. Fluorescent lamps emit much less heat, which is why you can touch them without burning yourself. And these were the screw-in types. And uh, these were the types that are still available in the stores, and which has brought the cost down tremendously in terms of their amount of energy use. But now we have the LED lights that are even much more efficient and cheaper than this one. So for the same wattage, the fluorescent lamp emits much more light and much less heat than what we call the incandescent bulb, which is now going completely by the wayside in favor of the more energy efficient lamps. Another way of making light called the light emitting diode LEDs. I uh, referred to this a little bit earlier. This has been perfected to make very bright lights now, not just these uh, small little bulbs that generate just a little bit, but this is called a light emitting diode. The most primitive being the little red lights that tell you whether your stereo is on or off. And LEDs give much more light per watt of electricity than other bulbs. And then they're, they're becoming very popular for more of the more energy efficient lighting as well in the homes. Okay, so in one of the final topics of this chapter, we're going to talk about two types of circuits. One we call series circuit and one we call parallel circuit. In this slide, we're going to start out talking about the series of circuits and the characteristics of the series circuit have these three properties. The electric current follows only through a single pathway. That is to say that as soon as you close the switch and allow this, uh, have a continuous conductor, from the positive terminal of the battery to the negative terminal, then the current can only flow in the path that is shown by the wires that leading up into and out of the filaments and back to the source, and back to the power source or the voltage source. The total resistance to current is the sum of the individual resistance. So what this says is that if I take a circuit with three light bulbs that you can see here attached to a a battery of a fixed voltage, then if I flip the switch down, the light, the, all three lights will go on. But if I put three more lights in here, then I will have six light bulbs and therefore six times the resistance. So the current will drop as a result and therefore the, the lights will get dimmer the more lights that I add onto the circuit. The total resistance to current is the sum of the individual resistances, which means that if the get more and more individual resistances, the total goes up, which means the current goes down. So there'll be less current as we add more and more light bulbs onto the circuit. A third point is that the current is equal to the voltage supplied by the source divided by the total resistance. So the same current is flowing through every bulb and the voltage drop will, will be, or in this case we should say the, 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 the current can be calculated as the rating on the battery in volts divided by the sum of the resistances of each of these in ohms. Now remember, the units that we use are the electrical potential is measured in volts, the resistance is measured in ohms, and the current is measured in amperes, which is in coulombs per second. So those are the three points of, of, of the series circuit. Some other points to keep in mind, the total voltage impressed across the series circuit divides equally div series circuit divides among the individual devices in the circuit so that the sum of the voltage drops across the resistance of each individual lamp, if the device is, is, a, is a light that we've been showing, is equal to the total voltage supplied by the source. So in other words, if I know the total voltage supplied by the source and I that voltage then will be equal to the, by Ohm's law, will be equal to current times resistance, and the resistance will be the sum of all the resistance, resistors due to all the different lights that are in series with each other in the circuit. Uh, the voltage drop across each device, uh, as we've said, is, is, is proportional to its resistance. And finally, if one of the lights in the circuit fails, that is to say that the wire breaks in one of these lights that you see in the picture, then the current through 
the entire circuit goes to zero. It's the same as opening the switch. When a light filament burns up, it separates, it breaks at a point, and electrons can no longer flow across in the filament. If one of those light bulbs fail, that has made what we call an open circuit, which means that there's a break in the conduction within the bulb, then the current will not only stop in that bulb, it will force it to stop in the entire circuit, which means all the other bulbs will go out as well. Hence, one of the reasons why the Christmas tree lights, which is what we generally make as a string of lights in a Christmas tree a strand, is not done this way, but it is done in a different way, which is called the parallel circuit. So the parallel circuit, what we see here is that we have a voltage source, and now instead of three light bulbs stacked in series with each other, that is to say that they are in line with each other, they are following in line with the, through the same conductor, the conductor is split into three different paths, each of them going to a different bulb. So now what happens is that even if the break in the circuit occurs in one of the bulbs, the other two will in fact uh, stay, will stay on. In this case, the voltage is the same across each bulb. Notice that the wire goes from the positive side of the terminal all the way through to the negative side. Assuming that there is no resistance in the wire, that all the resistance is in the filament, which is generally a good approximation, then the voltage difference between A and B will simply be the voltage difference across the battery itself, because the voltage at A will be the same as the positive terminal here, and the voltage at B will be the same as the negative terminal on the bed. Well, the voltage has to be the same across each device because the voltage across each of these lamps is essentially the voltage from A to B, which is, in fact, the voltage of the source. So all three of these lights have the same voltage, see the same voltage difference. Therefore, we'll assume that for now that they were the same, have the same resistance, then they will all have the same current. And it won't matter whether or not one bulb is on or we're not on we will still uh, get the, the, um, the current flowing through the two that are on. So the total current in the circuit divides among the parallel branches. If they're equal resistance, then they will divide equally, and often they will be because there will be like, for example, there could be lights of the same, the same resistance. Then the amount of current each branch is inversely proportional to the resistance of the bands. Okay, we know that, that's just Ohm's law. That just says that the voltage difference across the each of the lights is equal to the current times the resistance. The total current in the circuit equals the sum of the currents in its parallel branches. So um, the total current in, for if this switch is closed and all three of them are on, the total current is going to be three times the current of each one of these, because each one has a current. You know, one amp, for, one amp of current, then all three of them on means that, well, if three amps coming to this point which then break off like a stream of river into one amp into each of its subsectors, each, each of its branches. And then it will recombine into three amps over here. So if each of these lamps would generate one use or, or be able to handle one amp of current or actually have one amp of current going through them, then the line feeding that has to have three amps because that current gets broken up into three different directions. Therefore, so the total current, the current actually supplied by the battery itself, is the sum of the currents in its parallel branches. As the number of branches is increased, the overall resistance of the circuit is decreased. And therefore, we have more current that is flowing uh, to supply all of the different parallel branches. And a break in one path does not interrupt the flow of charge in the other path. So it turns out that if you are building a Christmas tree lights, you want to hook, the, you want the battery lights to be all connected in parallel and not in series. So that if one of them breaks, you don't lose the whole string of lights. Uh, when two identical lamps in a circuit are connected in parallel, uh, does the total resistance, is the total resistance less than the resistance of either lamp? 
Is it the same as the resistance of each lamp? Is it less than the resistance of each lamp? Or is it none of the above? That's a little tricky question. Uh, when two identical lamps in a circuit are connected in parallel, the total resistance is less than the resistance of either lamp, the same, or it's less than the resistance of each lamp or none of the above. It's less than the resistance of either lamp. Resistors in parallel are like extra lines at a checkout counter. More lines means less resistance, allowing for more flow. So uh, that's, the, 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 that's basically saying that the net resistance, the total resistance, is less than the resistance of each lamp, uh, or the resistance of either lamp. And furthermore, we can see that from here, as you add more lamps in here, the voltage hasn't changed, the current in each lamp hasn't changed, so the net supply of current has dramatically gone up, and therefore the battery sees a, a, a total resistance of all of them together as going down. The analogy with water can be helpful, helpful in visualizing the circuits. The water current, will, which, which splits into two streams, each falls at the same height, and the total current is the sum of two currents. With two pipes open, the resistance to water flow is half what is with one pipe open because we have twice the flow. And twice the flow with the same pressure means that the net resistance has gone down. So a conceptual example, a light, the light bulbs in the figure are identical. Which configuration produces more light? That's one question. Secondly, which way do you think the headlights of a car are wired? Ignore the change of filament resistance. So in other words, we just assume that, that, that which way would you want to wire these so that if you have a filament that burns out, you don't lose both headlights. Well, it's obviously the one to do is the one in parallel because if I lose a filament here, I still maintain the same current through the other one. And so, uh, if, uh, whereas if I lose a filament in one of this bulbs in a series, then, then the current stops in both and I suddenly am driving in the dark instead of with just one headlight. Par parallel is better. Another place where uh, parallel circuits are important is in the wiring of homes or commercial buildings or any buildings actually that use electricity. The way that this works is that um, homes are wired in parallel. They have a common 120 volt power source from the electricity company. That's the potential voltage that's supplied in the circuit. As more and more devices are connected, we need more and more current that flows through the wire. So imagine, for example, if I have a lamp, a heater, and a toaster, that are all plugged into different outlets, then we want to make sure if they come from a common source that they are connected in parallel, and which of course they are. So if you plug each of these devices into a different outlet in the wall, effectively what you are doing is adding each of these in parallel with the other one. So they, eat, they, they, they work as parallel circuits, as a parallel circuit. Therefore, as you add more toasters, heaters, or lamps, then you are increasing the current that you need that needs to be supplied. So in this case right here, if I have two amps of current through the lamp, a 10 through the heater, and eight through the toaster, I need to be able to handle or supply 20 amps of current in order to, for all three of these devices to work. If I add on another heater, then I will be up to 30 amp. Now the problem is that the wiring, the wiring in the house, can only handle a certain current before it overheats. And when that happens, it can start a fire in the house. So we need to have a safety protection. Most of them are set at 20 amps, which means that if I start to draw more than 20, it will turn off everything. It will prevent anything from, from continuing, and at that point, we have what we call a power outage, which can be fixed by either flipping the switch on a circuit breaker or in the old fashioned cases, we used to replace what was called a fuse. And a fuse is a very thin wire that is designed to break when the safety limit of the wire is reached at 20 amps. So simply replacing the fuse is not the solution to the problem. The solution is making sure 
you don't add more devices to the line to exceed the 20 amps. Nowadays, we have what's called a circuit breaker, and you go down to the basement and reset the breaker so that it turns back on again. But again, it will only work if you lower the, the, the load or unplug some of your devices that are causing the overload. When the current is excessive, this overheating can result in a fire, which requires that we have, in fact, the safety, we we'll call it the safety here, which is, which is called the fuse. So also the addition of excess devices increases the amount of current through the wire. This produces an overload, as we talked about in the last slide. And of course, that is the whole point of having a fuse or a circuit breaker that will shut it off so that the overloading or the increased current through the wire does not end up starting a fire. Uh, safety fuses are wired that melt when the given current is exceeded. So uh, they are designed to basically make, a, make it an open in the circuit and keep it from uh, the current from flowing so that it automatically actually opens up a switch. That switch then shuts off all of the devices that are on the same that are on the same circuit. They are connected in series along the supply line to that prevents the overloading as we've shown before. Uh, they are replaced by circuit breakers in modern buildings, which is another way of interrupting the opening the switch to stop current through all the devices that are on that circuit. Damaging effects of shock result from current passing through the body. Now, as I mentioned earlier, whenever you get a current that exceeds a tenth of an amp or so, it can be a very, it can be a, it, it will be a fatal condition. The question is, what electric potential is required to make that happen? And that's more difficult because it depends on whether your body is dry or moist, or your fingers, or you're in a humid environment where your skin is moist or sweaty, versus one where it's very, very dry. But generally, you don't want to touch terminals that are above 100 volts. Anything above 100 volts will produce a pretty good tingle through your body and generally can be potentially dangerous. And finally, the, the electrical potential between one part of your body and another does depend on your, your body condition, as we just discussed. And the resistance of your body can vary between 100 and 500,000 ohms. If, in fact, we would say a tenth of a amp is enough to kill you, then you would want to make sure that you would not want to exceed, in this case V over R, not exceed a thousand volts from a source which would be, which would then give you a thousand volts divided by a hundred, uh, which would be is about 0 0.1, which would be in fact enough to kill you if that voltage source was able to deliver enough current. Uh, a few minor, final things to point out here, not all materials fall in the category of conductors or insulators. Some of them are called semiconductors. And we've seen one example of them uh, that where we only allows the current to flow in one direction. It, can, it conducts very well when your voltage is in one polarity connected in the circuit, but if you reverse the voltage, then the circuit no longer, or the uh, semiconductor will stop and it therefore becomes an insulator. So it oscillates between being a conductor and insulator depending on the sign of the voltage. And we talked about that when we talked about making a, a, a transformer that uh, will generate a 12 volt power backup or charging device for your laptop computer, for example. So consider the lamp powered uh, by a battery. Does charge flow out of the battery and into the lamp? Does it flow from the negative terminal to the positive terminal? Does it flow after a time delay when the switch is closed? Or D, through both the battery and the lamp. So consider a pan, pow, lamp powered by a battery. Which, how does charge flow? Does a charge flow out of the battery and into the lamp from the negative terminal to the uh, positive terminal after a slight delay? And, oops, that's the one I took out. The answer is it flows from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. But it does not, um, yeah, it flows from the negative terminal to the positive term. Superconductors, okay, so there's another class. We talked about conductors, insulators, semiconductors. There's another class that are called superconductors, and they typically work 
only at very super low temperatures. Uh, many of the magnets that are used in uh, magnetic resonance imaging for getting a scan done of your body are done with superconducting materials that mean basically that you can get almost infinite current without supplying, with supplying almost zero voltage. And then somebody, you can actually get enormous current with extremely small voltage. And that's because the resistance goes to zero. If the resistance of the wire goes to zero, then the material becomes superconducting. Um, the ones that are used in Fermilab, for example, are, are alloys of niobium-10, niobium and 10, uh, there, and there are different variations on that, but uh, basically they are rather exotic. They are not commercial in the sense that you will never buy one and bring it home and connect it to your device. But they are very useful if you need, ever need to get an MRI done when you need a body scan for a broken bone or you know, a, a tumor diagnosis or something like that. Uh, there are especially cases where these things are extremely important. And that's the end. We'll stop there and we have now finished chapter 23 and the next time we come back we will start on chapter 24.